campuses around the world we're glad to welcome all of you to the service what a joy to have all of you brethren in the house you're welcome well can we celebrate the world with a shout glory somebody shout a powerful amen grab your pen your notebook your bible with your phones you can be seated with your sweet smart self let's get in the word of his grace like you've always done help me share the videos on your on your phones go to all your pages and all the groups where you belong let's get the word around the world we're still examining brother paul's revelation of identification the signature of the pauline theology second peter chapter 3 verse number 15 an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom, the word Sophia, given unto him, hath written unto you. According to the wisdom, given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction according to the wisdom the sophia the insight given unto him hath written so brother peter acknowledged that there was a sophia there was an insight given to brother paul that was very outstanding when it comes to the old testament and what was peculiar about brother paul's insight you know, it's such that Brother Peter said it's hard. He didn't say it's impossible to be understood, but he says it's hard. It means it requires extra work. It requires extra diligence. It requires extra attention paid to the writings of Brother Paul. There are two ways this comes out. It's either he is referring to the letters of Paul with the authority as much as that of the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament writing, or brother Peter was saying that they mishandled Paul's writings. And so eventually they mishandled the Old Testament books. I would like to stay with the latter, which is they mishandled Paul's writings. And eventually when you mishandle the Pauline theology, you mishandle the Old Testament writings. Now, brother Paul's writings are about the Old Testament books. And so today as well, when you see somebody dishonestly, dishonestly, handling the Pauline writings dishonestly, he now begins to siga o. if you remember, siga o, things that are secret, things that are not loud, all right? He begins to siga o Paul's revelation and reveals Paul's absolute silence. He didn't get that. So he goes silent on what Paul taught and begins to go loud on what brother Paul even didn't mention. That's being dishonest. That kind of fellow is a very wicked person that's why paul calls it the doctrine of christ which is what he taught and preached and paul also mentions the fact that if you see anybody mentions otherwise contrary to the didache that we have taught you he says mark that person and avoid that person altogether it's not in that matter you begin to say let's walk in love somebody's been dishonest about the sacred writings of the holy scriptures you don't walk in love with such a person the love that person needs is distance that distance and that avoidance is the highest love you can display to somebody who is being dishonest about the things we teach and about the truth of the gospel of christ he didn't say pray for them he didn't say try to be understanding with them he didn't say try to be out with them he says mark them and avoid them completely he says, mark them. So someone says, he knows how to sieve, you know. You know, I can, I can be among people that may not be agreeing with the things we teach because I know how to sieve and I know how to manage. I know what to take and what not to take. Well, you must also be careful because behind every doctrinal persuasion is a spirit. Behind every doctrinal persuasion is a spirit. You may know how to sieve it. Will you also sieve the spirit? Because in First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, Brother Paul says, Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. How? By giving heed to seducing spirits. 
seducing spirits where do you find seducing spirit that is the doctrine of devils so behind every false doctrine there is a spirit in fact behind every doctrinal persuasion there is a spirit and that is why you must be careful not to reason with such people just avoid them completely mark them you can't be wiser than the scriptures mark them and avoid them otherwise you get in the compromise before you know you begin to speak you know the problem with wrong teaching is that a lot of young people that i see today speaking gibberish on social media and uh, speaking nonsense they are products of churches where the truth is not taught the danger with wrong teaching is that after a while a man begins to get into atheism that's the danger with wrong, wrong teaching after a while people begin to get into atheism there is no god because all the wrong things you taught them were lies when the scriptures are not rightly divided anything you teach is a lie the truth of the scripture can only be found when it is rightly divided listen you cannot find truth in a lie you cannot find truth in a lie so when scriptures are not rightly divided anything the man is teaching is a lie it's falsehood and the problem with falsehood is it may look like it is working for a moment but when the truth of life really comes down on a man the emptiness the emptiness of wrong teaching will show because there will be no substance there that a man can rely on and that is why a lot of church people end up saying there is no god most of the people you call atheists today we are church people they even know the bible it's just that they can't find the truth in the bible so some of them conclude it's a white man's religion that was forced down our truth why do we stay with a book written by a white man let's go back to traditional worship at least we can identify with traditional worship and the problem is because the scriptures were not well interpreted so the truth of the scriptures was kept away from those people and they grew up in falsehood and after a while everything they thought they knew collapsed like a pack of cards so they conclude that there's no god that is the danger of wrong teaching and that's why when people are teaching the word of god in dishonesty you mark them and avoid them don't allow them preach through your television in your room don't allow them preach through your radio in your house because your children are listening you completely protect your family and protect your own self because it's a spirit behind every wrong teaching including books you read books you say after all it's just a book i'm trying to see what they are saying you don't need what they are saying have you finished reading the ones we are saying you have not even finished the one we are saying you've got to be careful there is a seducing spirit attached to every doctrine of devils there is a spirit that seduces and you can't afford to be careless with the sanity and the sanctity of your spirituality someone once said that brother paul was not you know was not loud in preaching prosperity because he didn't walk in it somebody said that a man of god said that that you know why brother paul didn't talk a lot about the prosperity gospel because he didn't walk in the reality of it so that's why he was silent on it and timothy was focused and you must be focused that's why he could teach paul's doctrine so brother timothy was focused that's why it's agreed that whosoever wrote the book of hebrews is paul's disciple because you will see the pauline signature in the book of hebrews even though paul didn't write it you know and uh, the writer of hebrews even mentions timothy who was the loudest mention of brother paul's disciple i think it's apollos who wrote the book of hebrews you know but it's not a matter to tear our trousers over whoever wrote it the important thing is that it's written so paul in his discussion shows a man that has a grasp of the old testament based on the doctrine of christ because you see what gave everybody the bridge to the old testament is jesus what gave everybody the bridge to the old testament is jesus that's why john will call him the logos theos logos that is he is the word of god he is the thinking he is the idea 
The Logos is a very heavy word among literary writings of that century. When you write a poem, they say, what's the Logos? Every time in the days of Brother Paul, when you wrote a poem, they will ask you, what's the Logos of this poem? That is, what is your heart that you communicate in words? Or what is your intention? Logos. Sometimes it can be used as words. And sometimes it can be used as thoughts. And sometimes it can be used as intent. And it can be used as idea. What is the idea behind the writing? What is the mindset or what thinking pattern is the writing communicating to the reader? What's the logos? So when John calls Jesus the word, he is speaking from an after resurrection reality. That is, Jesus is the word. But John didn't see that in the four gospels. It was the resurrection that pointed his attention to the logos. Then the details of the eyewitnesses of the incarnation now became doctrinal to them. When they understood the resurrection and they understood that Jesus is the logos, then whatever the eyewitnesses communicated about the incarnation all came together as doctrine. Now please stay with me. We also discover that even a James was now using Jesus' template to teach in the book of James because now he has the logos by the spirit of truth he now sees it in John chapter 16 verse 12 and 13 I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now next verse how be it when he the spirit of truth is come so the epistles are the spirit of truth or like I told you the other day the epistles are the allos paracletos the spirit of truth or another comforter. That is the epistles. He will guide you into all the truth. Which is like we saw, like leading a blind man to see. He will guide you into all the truth. So as mentioned earlier, if you put Paul's First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 and 4. And then you put Paul's Romans chapter 16 verse 25 and 26. If you put them side by side with Jesus' Luke 24, 25 to 27, they are all saying the same thing. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, which is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures so jesus's hermeneutics and what brother Paul taught is in tandem, is in agreement with one another. Because there is a consistency of theology. Why? Because it's the spirit of truth. And truth does not change. Truth is consistent. Truth remains the same no matter how many years it takes. Truth never changes. So there's a consistency of doctrine in the communication of the Pauline theology and Jesus' theology. Now, so the details of that encounter on the way to Emmaus and the one he did, you know, in the room when he met them is what produced the Pauline letters. Did you hear what I said? The Pauline letters are a product of what Jesus taught on the way to Emmaus and a product of what he taught them in the room for 40 days. Those encounters produce the Pauline letters. So you can say, the same platform and the same things were said. Don't forget, the crux of all that was said is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Which is what Peter said, the glory that will follow. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And look at how the glory of Jesus was explained. Please pay attention. Look at how the glory of Jesus was explained. Notice that the glory he referred to was that repentance 
and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's Luke 24, 47. It is the glory of his kingdom, which is the glory of the Sota, which is Soteria in the hearts of men. The glory of his kingdom is the glory of the Sota. The glory of the Sota is Soteria in the hearts of men. Remember what Satan pointed to Jesus in that temptation. He opened his eyes to see the kingdoms of this world and the glories of them and said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these things. Jesus said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only will you serve. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. And definitely you will see in this that the kingdom of Christ is no joke at all. So put that with Paul. The way brother Paul explains the Old Testament books will come side by side with how Jesus did the same thing in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, 26, 27. So in between what Jesus said, his eyewitnesses, you will find Paul's revelation. In between what Jesus said and the eyewitness account, you will find Paul's revelation. I also believe that this is subjective. What I'm about to say now, you don't have to take it, but you can take it. That the senses with which the twelve saw Jesus must have also been a blockade in a way. You know, the, the twelve. They saw Jesus, they were with him, they ate with him and all of that. Because there's something about familiarity. It affects many things. Somebody you're seeing all the time, you are talking to all the time. Sometimes he will crack jokes with you and play with you. And so you are not able to even know when he's serious and when he's playing. So that familiarity must have affected the perception of those 12. That's why a man that never saw Jesus, it took that man to unfold the revelation that the Christ was communicating. I don't know if you're getting that. All right. So like I said, brother Paul didn't have that opportunity. He said, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now know we him no more. What Paul was saying is, those guys knew Christ after the flesh. But they ought not to know him after the flesh anymore. Then he says, therefore, if any man in Christ, a new creature, we know no man after the flesh. Meaning to really know Christ, you must leave elements and the physical and zero in on the spiritual. Now, after the flesh will be two things. Number one, eyewitness account. And number two will be four gospels and the human witness of his resurrection. He now says, if any man be in Christ, he advances that to what Christ said in that day you will know that I am in you. I am in you. Lo, I am with you always. In that day, Jesus speaking, you will know that I in you. Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always. Brother Paul calls those two statements the new creation. So it's just a further explanation of the things he has written. So the witnesses play a role. But the spirit of truth now advances. Because the spirit of truth will bring to your remembrance all things I have said. That is, it will call to mind the things Jesus said. Because the things he said in the four gospels are the announcement of his kingdom. Please pay attention. The things Jesus said in the four gospels, all the parables and all of his communications in the, in the four gospels, we are about his kingdom. He was announcing his kingdom. He announces his kingdom. This is in my kingdom. 
then he uses parables to talk about it. He uses things to say those things. But he's announcing, like we said, he is campaigning. He is campaigning about his kingdom. He talks about the forgiveness of sins, which is his kingdom. Then he tells them, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. All other things will be added to you. And someone says, I don't go after other things. The kingdom will give me other things. How did you get that? You better go about other things. <laughs> you better get a job. Get a business. Make investment. If not, poverty will show you 99. And you will still go to heaven because you are born again. Reading the Bible out of context. If you read on, after he says, seek the kingdom, all these other things shall be added. He now talks about prayer. He says the kingdom is what God has done to deliver us from sin and the wicked one. The kingdom is what God has done to deliver us from sin and the wicked one. And he's telling them, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door shall be opened. And people thought he's talking about a job, a wife, a house. Then he now tells them, pray the father. He will give you his kingdom. Or he will give you his spirit. That's why in that last prayer, he now says, If you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father give the Holy Spirit? He didn't say, shall the father give you cars and houses. You give your children cars. You give your children houses. You give your children money. How much more shall the father give the Holy Spirit? The father gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Not houses and cars and jobs. Now somebody said, Dr. Damina has come again. So God doesn't give cars and houses. Yes, God doesn't give cars and houses. God doesn't give cars and houses. You buy a car the same way an unbeliever buys a car. You buy a car the same way a thief buys a car. You buy a car the same way a native doctor buys a car. The Father gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. The spirit of his son, which is salvation from sin and the wicked one. <laughs> it's a seller point. That's why I'm coming up. Because there's a lot of renewing of the mind that we need to all get involved with. We need to renew our minds quickly. I'm serious about this. Jesus almost never gives you a platform to ask for things. Go and read his teachings. He says, take no thought what you shall eat. Take no thought what you shall drink. You know why? People were eating and drinking before he came. Take no thought what you shall wear. When he came, there were dresses. So he didn't come for clothes. He didn't come to give you food and water. It was available. Before Jesus showed up in the incarnation, people were drinking and eating. The richest men on earth were on ground. Before Jesus showed up. So he didn't come to give you money. He didn't come to give you cars and houses. He told you what he will give you. The father will give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him. Which is salvation. Which is deliverance from the evil one. That's why when you got born again, you've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and translated to the kingdom of his dear son. Getting things is not the campaign of the kingdom. Getting things is not the campaign of, that's not what Jesus was campaigning. The system of things was designed by man.
Did you hear what I said? The system of things were designed by man. Already, because before Jesus came, it's man. When you see Satan tempting Jesus, Satan is not a fool. When you see him tempting Jesus, he is talking about a system designed by man. How wealth goes, who decides who is in what class. And I'm sure you all know that men sat down and they have shifted global economy. Wealth has shifted. Wealth has shifted. The reason why some people don't know that wealth has shifted is because they are trading in little matters. People that really have money and are involved in serious businesses, they know right now that wealth has shifted. And people are thinking of new ideas for business. Wealth has shifted. And it's designed by men. It's designed by men. <laughs> There's a battle even in the money world right now. The way money used to operate is no more the way money is operating now going forward. They are beginning to intimidate the money market. And it's a matter of time. All orchestrated by man. It's not God. It's not God. It's man. Wealth is man-made. It's designed by man. Men sat down and decided how to exchange things of value. It's man. Satan says to Jesus, the glories of this world I will give to you, for it was given to me. That means Jesus didn't come to give us the glories of this world. And if it was a lie, it would not be a temptation. The reason why it's a temptation is because it is true. You can't tempt me on the basis of a lie now. For it to tempt me, there must be reality in it. <laughs> That's why it's a temptation. He showed him the kingdoms and the glories. He's talking about the hearts of men and how that it is men that control wealth and control the spectrum of things that men seek for. And he said to Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you the hearts of men and the wealth that men control. Jesus said, me, worship you. I have my own way of taking back the heart of men. So you better worship me. Because I won't worship you. So instead of Jesus bowing down for Satan to give him the hearts of men, which he will not give, Jesus collected the heart of men by conquest. He died and paid the price to restore man back to himself legally by his death. And today men's hearts are coming back to Christ. And along with the hearts of men coming back to Christ, the glory that men have acquired by their hands, they are bringing it to Christ. So you now get born again and your passion is a kingdom. So the money you have made in the world system, you use it in serving Christ. So the heart of man and the glories of this world are coming back to Christ because the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and it shall reign forever. How? Via the instrumentality of the saints. So Jesus' campaign was not for things. Jesus' campaign was for his kingdom. A system is already created. It's man that created the system. There are some phrases church people use. Even the Christocentric community they use those phrases and we need to explain those phrases because if we don't explain them, you'll be thinking what you shouldn't be thinking. Phrases like, you don't give to be blessed. You give because you are blessed. Blessed with what? You don't give to be blessed. You give because you are already blessed. What do you mean by blessed? Because that blessed has to be explained. Otherwise, you'll be thinking materialism. So which means if I have not been blessed materially, I don't give. And that cannot be correct. 
Because the churches in Macedonia gave out of their deep poverty. And the Bible says the riches of their liberality abounded. So that is like an oxymoron. How can a man be in deep poverty and be rich? Which means giving doesn't have to be because you have. It doesn't have to be because you have. It has to be because you are generous. You know people who are generous? They want to give even if they have to pull off their shoe and give to you. And walk without shoe. Because generosity in them drives them. Generous people always find something to give. Always. Those of you that stayed with your parents in the village who were very generous. Nobody comes to the house that is not giving something. Even if it is water, they will make sure you give him. Why? Because there's generosity in that family. They don't have to wait until there is chicken. No, no, no. The little they have, they share. Generosity is not dependent on the balance in your account. It is dependent on the balance in your heart. Generosity is dependent on the balance in your heart. So all that, we don't give to be blessed. We give because we are blessed. We need to explain the blessing. We give because we are blessed. Blessed in the fact that my sins are forgiven. Blessed by the fact that I am accepted by Christ. So I am giving, not motivated by material stuff, but motivated by my love for Jesus. So that's why that word blessed has to be explained. Let me also deal with something. There's another statement that is very porous. God blesses you so you can be a blessing. That's another statement we have to deal with. Very popular statement. God blesses you so you can be a blessing. You know what that statement, that's a very dangerous statement and it's porous. You know what that statement is saying? In other words, God gives to Pastor Jerome money so Pastor Jerome can give to Pastor Prince. So it means that God created a class in humanity. Why does God have to give to Pastor Jerome money to give to Prince? If God is giving Jerome money, why can't he give to Prince directly? No, it's a question. Is he afraid of Pastor Prince's glasses? Why wouldn't... Am I communicating? Come, 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 wake up. Remove your religious berets. Why wouldn't God, if he is giving to Pastor Jerome, why wouldn't he at the same time give to Pastor Prince? Is there any difference between the two of them? They are all children of God. So why will God give to Pastor Jerome so that Pastor Jerome can give to Pastor Prince? What kind of... What kind of, so God created class in humanity. Then it will be that God is behind poverty. Then it will be that if you are poor, it's because God doesn't like you. Then it will be that if you are rich, it's because God likes you. Then that begins to challenge the character of God. That means he gives to some people and he improvises some people. He makes some people in a class of advantage and others he puts them in a class where they are marginalized. That can't be my God. God didn't create class in humanity. <laughs> he makes the rain to fall on the good and on the bad. He makes the sun to shine on the evil and on the righteous. God never created class. In humanity. He never made people poor. And made other people rich. Because that's what it means. That I am blessed to be a blessing. When God said to Abraham. Blessed to be a blessing. It was not material stuff. The blessing is. I have made you righteous. By faith. You also preach righteousness by faith. So that everybody on earth. Can become righteous by faith. The blessing is not material stuff. The blessing is righteousness by faith. I am an hour. Romans chapter 4 verse 5. But to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Next verse. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man. 
That's where the blessing is. Unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. So the blessing is that God counts you righteous without performance. So when God says, Abraham, I have blessed you to be a blessing. What God was saying is, Abraham, you'll be justified by faith. So in the same way you're justified by faith, preach the same gospel until all the families of the earth are righteous by faith. I'm talking about money. Blessed to be a blessing. God bless me with two million so I can become the one sustaining others. That's class. That's not God. So you have to understand that there's a process done by man. So Jesus, therefore, becomes for us the message of God. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus becomes for us the mercy of God. Jesus becomes for us the heart of the revelation of God to us. The heart of the revelation of God to us. There's no way you will now proceed to say that Jesus taught against prosperity. Jesus never taught against prosperity. Some of the big boys he was chilling out with were rich boys. He had nothing against prosperity. Joseph of Arimathea, Mary Magdalene, Herod Steward, you know, who ministered to Jesus of their substance. He hung out with those. Matthew the tax collector. Zaki, the bad boy. He chilled with those guys. He also chilled with the poor. He chilled with the sinner. Because there was no class where Jesus was concerned. Prostitutes touch him. Lepers reached out to him. He never segregated. Everybody could access him. Because God never created class. Class is man's invention. The same God is rich unto all. That call up upon him. Out of a pure heart. There is no difference where God is concerned. Neither did Jesus also teach against lack. He never taught against prosperity. He never taught against lack. He allowed you to make the choice. Which one you are comfortable with? Of course, Jesus taught generosity. He taught generosity big time. He also condemned oppression. Oppressing people, he condemned it. So his kingdom has been explained. And we said that it's in his soteria. You remember that? In his soteria, where you have his own family. Where you have his own ecclesia. Those that he bought with his blood. Those that he bought unto himself. So, salvation must have ecclesiology. Just like brother Paul wrote the book of Romans, you will see salvation. The intent of salvation is a gathering, a family, ecclesia. Now Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now I hope the things I'm explaining will help you understand the four gospels better. Hello? Okay. Verse 10, that I may know him. Verse 8, he called the things he had called righteousness in verse 6. And he called those things scubalon. You remember scubalon? Physis, dung. That all the things he had acquired, which is righteous among Jewish people and the law, he has called them scubalon, dung. Paul, therefore, you cannot take away his background from his teaching. You can't take Paul's background from his teaching. He was an educated Roman citizen. Whether he was born there or acquired it, it doesn't matter. He was a, a Roman citizen. Look at Acts 21, 39. But Paul said, I'm a man which I'm a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. A citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee. Suffer me to speak unto the people. What Paul is saying. I'm not a small man. Where I'm coming from. is not a mean city. 
allow me to address these people. I love Brother Paul. Ah, I love Brother Paul. Man. So he was a dual citizen, a Roman and a Jew. What a combo. So he was able to understand what the kingdom of God really was because he operated in kingdoms. Both Roman kingdom, Jewish kingdom, and we need to understand the word citizenship, which explains a lot of things Brother Paul was saying. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 11, the prophecy of Jeremiah, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. The word neighbor is key. Underline if your Bible was mine, the word neighbor. The word neighbor there is the same word where you have citizen. Citizen. That is already by the prophecy of Jeremiah, he is bringing in a family. Is the word polites in the Greek. P-O-L-I-T-E-S. Polites. So when he gets to chapter 11, he says, Hebrews 11, he says, Abraham desired a city whose builder and maker is God. He now uses the word police, P-O-L-I-S, which is the same derivative with polities. That is, whose builder and maker is God. A city, therefore, refers to inhabitants. Inhabitants. A collective gathering of people who belong to the same person or who belong to the same place, a city. So Paul uses the word commonwealth. Commonwealth. He uses the word citizenship a whole lot. And don't forget, he was a Jew. Commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth. Citizenship. Three different concepts. He was a Roman citizen. So he was able to use the proper concept of what you can call the government of the Gentile with what Jesus was saying. So that's why his communication should be clear to us what he's referring to. Listen everybody. You can't have kingdom without people. You can't have kingdom without activity. You can't have kingdom without a culture. And you can't have kingdom without a king. What constitutes a kingdom is people, activity, culture, and a king. That's what constitutes a kingdom. So now Paul talks about citizenship. Now the way he uses the word citizen is very unique. Look at Acts 23 verse 1. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. There is a word there, the word politumai. Philippians 1.27 Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your good affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The word conversation there, that is your citizen behavior. Your citizen behavior. That's the word conversation. So Paul, therefore, is teaching a country in view. A country. Now for someone who is a Jew... And Roman, he is teaching citizenship. A country in view means God is creating his own country. The other ones were man created as it were. But God is creating his own country. God didn't create Nigeria. Men created Nigeria. Look at me everybody. God didn't create Nigeria. Men created Nigeria. God didn't create Ghana. Men created Ghana. God didn't create America. 
America, God's own country. God didn't create America. Man created America. God didn't create United Kingdom. Man united the kingdom. United Kingdom was part of European Union. Men sat down and said, we don't want to be part. Men took United Kingdom out of European Union. It's all man-made. All nations are created by men. Men determine what they want. And God does not usurp man's will. The political process is determined by men. That's why it is men that vote who becomes a president or who becomes a governor. It's not God. It's not God. God has never given any nation a ruler. Never. Whether the ruler is a good ruler or a bad one, every nation deserves the kind of ruler they have. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. So I say, but the Bible says, by me kings rule, and by me princes decree justice. Have you read the pretext and the post-text? Who is me there? Who is speaking? To who is he speaking? About what is he speaking? Didn't they teach you that in CRK? That when you read a place, you should ask those questions. Who spoke? To who is he speaking? About what is he speaking? So when you see such a thing, go pretext and post-text to understand context. If it's God that gives rulers, no country will have a bad ruler. Because all good things come from God. It's men that determine what they want. Because God gave man the freedom to choose what he wants. If I just gave you a good revelation, shout a good amen. Now, so brother Paul begins to bring in a country that God is creating. His own country. The other ones were man created as it were. But God is creating his own country. And these people are not located in a place. They are located in the spirit. Even though they come together in places. They are not located in a place. They are located in the spirit. Even though they come together in places. So Paul identifies that in the things that Jesus said, and we will see a few of them in a moment as I'm rounding up. So when you see him use the word citizen or citizenship, look at Philippians 3, 20 to 21. For our conversation is in heaven. Hear what he's not saying. He didn't say our conversation will be in heaven. Our conversation is in. Present. Is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall change our vile body. That's why we look for the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our conversation there means our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, our behavior or what we have, what we are constituted of, is in heaven. So he brings in a country. A country is a city of people, inhabitants, and all that. A country is a city, a people, inhabitants, and all that. So therefore, in teaching his soteria, he brings in community. He brings in behavior. So, you must therefore, if you are teaching the Pauline revelation, you must teach behavior. You must teach conduct. There's no way you teach the kingdom 
and teach soteria and you don't teach conduct. There's a culture that Jesus taught and there's a culture that brother Paul taught. That brings us into the concept of kingdom. The kingdom of God. Honey, I don't know if you remember back in the days we used to do what they call morning cry. I don't know if they are still doing it. Morning cry. Morning cry. 5 a.m. You carry megaphone. You look for an elevated place where if you speak, it will reach many houses. You go and stand there. Repent! Repent! You drunkard! You alcoholic! You smoker! The kingdom of God is at hand! We used to do morning cry. Morning cry. <laughs> that would be too much of a coming. Since I was born, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Because the first person who said that was John the Baptist. If he said that and Jesus came, and you are still saying that repent the kingdom is at hand isn't something wrong Matthew 3 2 and saying John the Baptist repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand repeated in Mark 1 14 the word at hand is the Greek word epizo, E-P-P-I-Z-O. It means approaching or has arrived or is eminent. The kingdom of God has arrived or the kingdom of God is approaching or the kingdom of God is eminent. John said that because the mission of John was to say that Christ was coming. The word kingdom is the Greek word basilia. 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 It refers to a rule or a reign. It has Old Testament synonym that we will explore. And this is John. The kingdom of heaven is here. Or the kingdom of heaven has come. Or the kingdom of heaven is coming. I remember back in the days we used to sing one song. We declare that the kingdom of God is here among us. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead men are rising. You remember that song? He didn't say we declare that the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom is here. The kingdom of God has arrived. Glory to God. I say glory to God. So he's talking about the king in the kingdom. Who does he call the king? He said the one coming after me is greater than I. The largest of his shoes I cannot lose. I baptize with water. He shall not use water. He shall baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's the way John put it. That sounds all all until he now says, this kingdom shall be led by a lamb. Huh? This kingdom shall be led by a lamb. Wow. You should get angry when John said that if you are a Jew. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. John 1.29 Now, because you are a Jew, when you hear a lamb to take away, it means the lamb will be killed. Jewish people understand that. The lamb will be killed. John says just that. He will take away. Look at John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He says that 
this lamb will give eternal life to all who believe. Basilea. So Jesus is talking about that kingdom. And then he sends his disciples to go around and preach the kingdom of God. He calls it the kingdom of God in Matthew 4.23. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. He went preaching what? The gospel of what? The kingdom. Whose kingdom? His kingdom. How will that kingdom manifest? By his death. By his death. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? The rule and the reign of the kingdom. Basilia. And the king of this kingdom is a servant. He is not a violent king and he's not a tyrant. The king of this kingdom is a servant. He is not a tyrant. He is not violent. That is antithetical because you can't say he rules and reigns and then he's a servant. It's a direct opposite of what a Jew would have thought was a king or what a Roman citizen would have thought. And Paul is saying this is God's own kingdom. This is not Caesar's kingdom. This is not Nigerian kingdom or government. Where if the president gives an instruction and you disobey, there are mobile policemen that will minister to you in the left hand of fellowship. No. This is the kingdom of a servant. The kingdom of a servant. And you belong in that kingdom. Glory to God. Somebody shout, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus. He's a servant. And he has put service in my heart for his kingdom and for the brethren. Don't your neighbor say, I am in the kingdom to serve you. I serve you the things of the spirit. I serve you the gifts of God in my heart. And above all, I serve you with the love of God. I give whatever I know will make you better. I'm in the kingdom of a servant and I learn service from the chief servant who owns the kingdom. He's not a violent king. He's not a tyrant. He's a servant king. He's a servant. He's a servant. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. It's not a kingdom of violence. It's a kingdom of righteousness. It's a kingdom of peace. It's a kingdom of joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom. Where is his righteousness? In you. Where is his peace? In you. Where is his love? In you. So where is his kingdom? In you. So I'm not going to ask you, don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? No, you are a part of the kingdom. Glory. Well, if you're a part of the kingdom, get on your feet and turn to your neighbor and tell him, I'm a part of the kingdom. I belong to a kingdom. Whose king is a servant? And has taught all the citizens how to serve his purpose and how to serve one another in love. Amen. Amen. That's the kingdom you belong. The kingdom where the king is a servant and will learn service from him. He takes water to wash the feet of the disciples. Symbolic communication that he will die to wash our sins. He didn't give us feet washing service. He used water as a symbol to show that in his death, he will be the one to wash us. He doesn't use things. He uses himself. He is the water. He is the bread. 
He is the water. He is the bread. He is the wine. He is the oil. He is all of that. He doesn't use things. So when he came inside you, the water came in. Water that never runs dry. When he came inside you, the bread came. Bread that you never hunger. When he came inside you, the oil came in. You don't need anointing service. You are the service of the anointed. Glory to God, somebody. He doesn't use things. He uses himself. Glory to God. Lift your right hands, Father. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. That revelation knowledge keeps growing big in our hearts. Throughout this period, as we consecrate ourselves to serve, we consecrate ourselves to serve your purpose, to serve your will on the earth, to administer your mission on the earth. Blessed to be a blessing until all families of the earth are blessed. Reaching out with the gospel, making manifest the savor of your grace. I decree that everyone under the sound of my voice is being equipped to manifest the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus. Great grace is upon you. Whatever is not planted by God around you is rooted out. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Well, if you're glad you're a part of God's kingdom and a citizen of heaven right now, then go ahead and celebrate it. I mean, wait. If you don't rejoice about these realities, what else are you rejoicing about? What else? What else is there to rejoice about? This is what matters most. Glory to God. Somebody shout, I'm a citizen of a superior kingdom in this world. I am in this world, but I'm not of this world. I come from a kingdom that rules over this world. I'm in charge. I'm a dual citizen. I'm a human being on the earth, and I reign in Christ in the spirit. So if earthly things are not working well, I switch to the other side and I cause miracles to happen. Somebody shout, I walk miracles. Somebody say, I make miracles happen. It's in my DNA. These signs follow me. I'm a producer of good works. I didn't hear a good amen. Now listen to me. I want to take up your offering. I'd like you to grab a good offering, everybody. We give in honor of God's word. We give in faith and we give with joy. Grab an offering, everybody. Hallelujah. Lift up your honor offerings. Father, we give with joy and we give.